All right. Looks like we are broadcasting. So we will give our audience a few moments here to log in and join us for today's live stream. But as um, people are starting to click on the link to join us here, um, let me just uh, first begin by um, introducing today's guest speaker, artist and educator, Pamela Lawton, who is connecting with us from New York. So hello, Pamela. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. So um, let me just uh, begin with a brief introduction to uh, today's talk, which is the kickoff of our March 2021 uh, series of the Siena Art Institute's um, ongoing cycle of artist talks, Starters Live. So for every Tuesday this month, we will be speaking with um, international creative professionals about the theme of accessibility and inclusion in art and design. Uh, today's speaker, Pamela Lawton, was hosted by the Siena Art Institute for the fall of 2019 as part of her Fulbright U.S. Scholar Grant. Uh, during her tenure here, she made art while forging new connections between her own creative process, her engagement with museums and the city of Siena, in addition to art making in response to the medieval built environment, she also engaged through research and teaching with the community of people with low or no vision, as well as the deaf community. As part of her Fulbright activities, she led workshops at Florence's Uffizi Gallery and Pitti Palace, the Beinecke Museum in Athens. And here in Siena, she also led artistic explorations with members of Rehabilita, a local community center that supports adults with psychiatric issues. And they work together at the Fisiocritici Museum of Natural History here in Siena. Pamela Lawton is inspired by her students and shares public art making practices with them, including in the galleries of New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she has taught for more than 10 years. While a faculty member at Eugene Lang College at the New School University, she created a study abroad program in Sri Lanka, and she has also taught American University undergraduate and graduate students in Corciano, Italy. It's really wonderful to have the chance to speak with you today, Pamela. My pleasure. Welcome, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here, and I express my gratitude to the Siena Art Institute in particular to Lisa and Miriam, and to the faculty and staff there, as well as the students. And also thank you Fulbright Italy for hosting me in the fall of 2019. And thank you everyone for being here today. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, begin sharing my PowerPoints. And so I'll be going through some of my slides. And let's see if I can do that now. Uh, so, it's, it's not giving me the option, uh, it, oh, okay, there it goes, well, I'm going to have to stop and then start again, Lisa. Yeah, that's fine, no problem, no problem. <laughs> we know you've got your slides, so that's the most important thing. <laughs> okay, great. I'll just mention as you're pulling up your slideshow to our audience members who are joining us today, you can feel free to leave um, comments or questions uh, during this live stream, which we'll be able to see and respond to at the end of Pamela's talk today. Lisa, are you getting a full screen now? Yes, it's coming in. Looks good. Perfect. So uh, thank you again for being here today. And I'm going to be talking a lot about my Fulbright during my time in Siena, what led me there, and a little bit about what's happened since. So as Lisa mentioned, my proposal was to interact with the city of Siena and with my students and with local artists in order to expand my art making practice to include the reciprocal feedback that I'm always getting from working with different types of students. So for example, uh, I wanted my Fulbright, during my Fulbright to make my artwork more tactile 
and more multisensory in keeping with my teaching of people with low vision, for example, for whom uh, multisensory engagement is a very important part of their art making practice. And so in this photograph on the right, I'm seen with a very tall painting. It's 18 feet tall by 12 feet wide, and it's made of 49 canvases. And I'm standing next to it, and I've got a, a long way to go to get to the top. And this painting is a focus on window reflections in Times Square. And I show it to you in part to talk about the relationship I have to scale in my own artwork and with my students. So my body being uh, related to each canvas panel and being kind of overwhelmed by the scale is an important part of my work. And I'd like to emphasize whole body engagement with students in order for one thing to let go and to relax because things beyond your control, beyond your peripheral vision, beyond your reach are uh, by definition harder to control and therefore more interesting in my opinion. So in this photograph, I'm bent over painting on the street in Times Square. I'm holding a a trowel in my one hand and two wide brushes in my other. And I'm painting the reflections that I see in the building. And I like students as well as uh, my own art making. I like to have people, I like to work outside. And I also like to work in museums and places that take us away from our, uh, well, <laughs> now COVID restricted lifestyles, right? Where we're all at home. And that's another chapter. But here I am painting outside using my whole body and looking at window reflections that then comprise this larger painting. And so the next slide shows uh, my studio in the Old World Trade Center in the 1990s. So that's a bit of a throwback. And this was part of a grant that I received through the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. And scale is a huge factor in this photograph because it's a 60,000 60, square foot space half a floor of the Twin Towers. I'm standing somewhere near the back and at the far end is my setup. So while painting there, I had to deal with the enormity of the place. I also had to do with, deal with fear because it was a, a high up altitude and the building swayed and having it be totally empty without any furniture was uh, very disorienting. And so I actually painted my way to uh, equilibrium while I was there. And here's a close up of that scene. And on the right, in the middle, there's a, a eight foot high plank leaning against the radiator. And that plank was my spot where I painted and drew. I literally crawled on the plank. Why did I do that? Because I needed to get a particular angle, the view through the windows, which shows the distorted reflections that I became obsessed with for decades, actually, in different ways. Um, that was the only way I could see the particular motif that I was interested in. And on the left uh, is a six foot high drawing that I did while I was there. That's about a third of the first piece I showed you. So now we're going to leap ahead. And this photograph is a pair of photos taken during a show called Art and Love in Renaissance Italy at the Metropolitan Museum. And I have been teaching a class there called Seeing Through Drawing with some beloved colleagues who may be here today. And we uh, basically challenge the premise that if you have low or no vision, uh, you therefore are only interested in three-dimensional things. That's kind of a premise that a lot of museums and educators have about working with people with low vision. So we try to make uh, drawing as multi-sensory as possible. And in the right-hand picture, well, we can see the relationship that scale plays to the artists working, the students, student artists working in the galleries. Uh, the boy in the right-hand picture, he's a teenager. He's bent over his large uh, board, large by museum standards. In general, museums like you to work on tiny boards, but here we are working on a 24-inch tall board. And we can see his relationship to his drawing. His head and his drawing have a similar uh, affinity in terms of size. And he's drawing on tar paper with white oil pastel. So he can feel the texture of the paper. He can feel roughly where the oil pastel goes. And he's drawing to verbal description. That's me in the middle top. I'm describing the Donatello on the right, which you cannot see. But uh, this guy has 
added some, taken some liberties, and he put a basketball on the head of the Donatello sculpture. By the way, borrowed from the Bargello Museum for this exhibition. So uh, in 2016, I went with my colleague Annie Least, and we taught uh, drawing and seeing in Siena, and it was inspired by the seeing through drawing class, and it expanded to include people with lower no vision and fully sighted people who wanted to have an alternative, multi-sensory, immersive drawing engagement with Siena. And that's what we did. We had a wonderful time. And here we are at the Pinacoteca Nazionale and uh, the participants are drawing to the verbal description of a painting by Simone Martini, uh, St. Augustine. And the artist in the foreground who's bent over her large board is using oil pastels and it's doing a wonderful job, not only of capturing some of the detail, but also gets the overarching um, shape of the panels being described that she's responding to. So that was a class in 2016 at the very same school where we are today, Siena Art Institute. So in preparation for my Fulbright, I, as I may have mentioned, well, I don't think I mentioned the medium of paper. Paper as a, as a tool, paper as a, as a medium, of course, we all use it when we draw, but paper making was part of my proposal, thinking that I wanted to tackle a new medium, a medium that was uh, tackle a tactile medium. And here I am spraying onto a frame, wet pulp, using my whole body, using the gesture that I encourage everyone to have when they draw and making a painted pulp surface that when it dries is very modeled and textural. Upon arriving in Siena, I continued the multi-sensory uh, drawing idea, of course. Here I am kneeling in front of the baptistery in Siena, making a tactile rubbing in my sketchbook from a sunk relief uh, stone uh, entryway. And here I am doing the similar activity inside of the Duomo in my sketchbook. So it was a wonderful alternative to typical sketchbook keeping, where instead of drawing, of course, I drew a lot too, but I also gathered textures from different places and different locations. And here I am in Rome, pouring pulp in the studio of Roberto Menino, and uh, he's a wonderful artist who teaches in Rome. And here I am mixing different colors in a vat on a screen. And here's uh, the next picture is where I dug into the layers of color using my hands and using tools to create a sunk relief design. And the motif itself is inspired by Siena, Sienese architecture and uh, wall reliefs. This next photograph shows uh, the Museo Physio Critici, which is the Museum of Natural History in Siena, and it shows their courtyard, a very large 15 meter long uh, skeleton of a whale and a fountain. And the Siena Art Institute introduced me to the museum and to a local group uh, that supports adults with psychiatric issues, Rehabilita. And here we are in the courtyard touching the whale. And in the next photo, we're uh, being led on a tour by Andrea Benocci, who is the conservator there. And you can see we have our large boards, drawing boards, and we were invited to touch an amethyst, a very large amethyst. And the participants, some of them were more comfortable with drawing than others. A lot of the participants in classes that I teach are not, don't consider themselves artists. Uh, this gentleman was totally game. He used charcoal, he used his whole arm. He began with rhythmic patterns before he began his uh, more observational drawing, which I'll describe momentarily. And he smartly put his board against a second chair, so he balanced himself. And here we have an outlay of specimens that the participants during this workshop were invited to select from for a tactile drawing experience. So here, my uh, collaborator and uh, partner, my husband, Danny Lietzel, is participating in uh, engaging a student to touch a shell to decide which specimen to use in his drawing. And here's another student 
drawing that fox-like creature behind her is taxidermied and she uh, explored it through touch and now she's making a drawing of it. So here we are next at the Uffizi Galleries and uh, in 2016 we visited there with the seeing through uh, the drawing through seeing drawing as seeing class and in 2019 I collaborated with the Uffizi and we invited a group of local uh, people with low or no vision. And for the first time in their uh, history, they had a combination touch tour and drawing class. So that was something I proposed to them. It was wonderful working with the Uffizi and uh, I learned a lot from all of the places where I worked from the Museum of Natural History, all the museums that I collaborated with, I learned so much about their techniques and their approaches and was so pleased that they allowed me to present uh, workshops there coming from uh, my own angle. At the Uffizi, the participants afterwards made self-portraits through touch in a workshop setting. And I also worked with the community of deaf adults there and at the Uffizi Galleries is an umbrella that includes the museum, the Uffizi Museum, as well as the Pitti Palace. The Pitti Palace is has a modern art gallery, and these uh, this group of people are drawing from different landscapes to create a composite landscape. And back in the studio, which was a beautiful palace room with statuary, they added water. They were using. Uh, watercolor soluble, water soluble crayons. Here they are adding water to their pieces, making collages. And in the foreground, you can see the Boboli Gardens gardener contributed fruits and vegetables and nuts from their garden. And just to say, when I was a student in Florence many years ago, I went to the Boboli Gardens every day to paint. That's where I first became interested in reflections by painting the water pools that reflected uh, statues and architecture. So to collaborate with the gardener and with the museum there was a dream come true. And I also participated in Vivere e un arte, arte e vivere, uh, a conference, an international conference at the Sistema Museale Castiglionese. And here uh, I'm introducing a project. It was rather funny because for two days, people had uh, attended a, a conference that had a lot of PowerPoints like this one. And uh, suddenly when it was uh, our turn to draw, 70 people, which included educators, museum staff, people with disabilities, students, the whole collection of people, more than 70, suddenly became moving, energized, and drawing. So, and that's Jessica Buffa who invited us to be part of the conference. And here people are just kind of in motion. I love this picture because it shows what drawing can do. Drawing can, if we all do it, it just, it's such a freeing act. Here I am working in uh, Florence at the Palazzo Strozzi. While I was in at the conference, the Vivere conference, I met uh, Irene uh, who, uh, Balzane, sorry, who is an educator at the Strozzi Palace. And she invited me after that, here she is in the foreground, invited me to do a workshop with the museum educators there. So we're drawing during the Natalia uh, Gancharova exhibition, and here they are, uh, we're making mixed media self-portraits. And I couldn't be complete without praising uh, my inter-country Fulbright grant, thanks to Fotis uh, Flavotomas, who is also going to be an artist in residence and a speaker on this series, uh, through Fotis and the Greek uh, Fulbright office, I was invited to go to Athens. And here I am with a group of educators, people with lower no vision, artists, museum staff, etc. And we're warming up in the galleries. 
And here we are, here's Fotis on the right. Here we are drawing to verbal description. And here we are making collages. And in this picture, I'm describing uh, my process as I make a self-portrait with masking tape, my eyes closed, touching my face. And then uh, moving right along, the Benaki also hosted a second workshop outside at the Picionis Way, which is uh, an ancient walkway leading to the Acropolis that the uh, early 20th century Greek architect, Demetrius uh, Picionis, restored and added his uh, amazing um, natural, uh, understated yet patterned and immersive approach to stone and to architecture. So here he's restored a 12th century church, uh, restored the facade with fragments. And our participants during the second day workshop were able to make rubbings on the walls of this 12th century church. And um, the Benaki Museum oversees this structure. And in this section, uh, the students and the everyone is making a collage using different papers. So they've made stone rubbings from the walls of the church, from the floor, from the wood, from nature, and assembling them into collage. And carrying on with my own art, uh, here I am and preparing to make an impression from a stone fragment. So I'm back in Siena at the University of Siena, formerly a cloister and the walls are lined with ancient fragments. Now this photo doesn't show it, but many of the fragments are covered in graffiti from the college students that go there. None, nonetheless, I did try to do it uh, sort of a, a more established way and not succeeding, I decided to go for it. So here I am stealthily cleaning a fragment and here I've put my handmade paper from studio in Rome and stuck it on top of the fragment, pushed it in, wrapped it with a bungee cord. And we did uh, get approached by a pair of uh, college officials who were not keen on my project. But while I lengthily explained to them all the different things about it, the paper had a chance to set. And I was able to leave with a nice piece of impression, which I then combine in my mixed media collage in this photo. So this was, a, a, it says 2020, even though I did it in 2019, because I find, refined it a little bit back in New York. I made a series of collages taken from the different impressions and rubbings. So for example, you can see in this detail, uh, it's a combination of linen with oil stick, graphite on tracing paper, cast paper made from various things. This is handmade paper in the center. It's all handmade paper, but the central panel I made in my apart our apartment in Siena with a blender and then did a rubbing with graphite crayon on a fragment. So I had a lot of fun. Uh, it was one of those moments in an artist's life where I took on something unfamiliar, something awkward, something beyond my comfort zone in a major way, which is these kinds of fragments, fragmented collages. I was very pleased when I came back that a studio mate, Sid, said to me, oh, I see the connection with your multi-panel pieces from, from uh, the World Trade Center and from 42nd Street and all those other pieces that you've been working on for so long. So it was very nice to make that connection. Sometimes it's fantastic to have another artist's eyes to uh, make obvious something that you've been kind of channeling as an artist. Here's another detail. Here's a, a, a my last piece from Sienna. It's a incised line relief based on my daily walk of past a series of windows and fountain and balcony right next to the Siena Art Institute. And then the next and last series are things I've done since I've come back from the, uh, from Italy and uh, trying to keep the momentum, keep the, uh, the new medium, keep some Italian ideas. So here uh, it's a detail from a stairway 
uh, captured from a stairway at the Ambrosiano Biblioteca in, uh, in Milan, and it's poured pulp with painted pulp. And it has, if you ran your hands across, it has a wonderfully uh, bumpy surface. Now this piece uh, I did during COVID, uh, well, still during COVID now, but in the summer of 2020. And <clears throat> the piece is called Lawn Visit. When my mother had COVID, she uh, was recovering in the second floor window and I greeted her on the lawn, speaking to her through our cell phones. She pressed her face against the screen. That inspired this piece. This next piece is related to the other Ambrosiano, and it also has a textured surface. And last but not least, I wanted to give a shout out to another form of multi-sensory engagement, which is to collaborate with actors and directors and virtual theater and a script. So one of the things I've been doing in during COVID with Danny, my partner, Danny Lietzel, is we've been uh, working on virtual backgrounds for the Metropolitan Playhouse, which in ordinary times uses uh, a real stage. So in this series, in this uh, screenshot, the actors are uh, from a play called Aftermath, written in 1919 by an African-American female playwright, Mary Powell Burrell. And each actor is in a different side of the cabin and so it was our vision to um, create backdrops, thanks to Alex Rowe, the director of the theater. And so I just want to express my gratitude once again to Siena Art Institute, to the Fulbright in Italy, as well as Greece, to Shama, the studio that hosts me, the Met Access team, that's the accessibility group, I teach with at the Met and Danny Lietzel. And uh, I can be reached, my email and my website is on the lower left. And I'd like to thank you all for listening today. Thank you so much, Pamela. This was really wonderful to have this overview of um, some of your recent work, as well as reflections of the work leading up to and uh, during your, your Fulbright activities. So it's wonderful to have that presentation from you. And we've gotten a lot of really wonderful, positive comments, people checking in from different places around the world in the comment section. Um, a lot of people found the masking tape really fascinating to see. Um, we had a question from uh, Jeff Shapiro, who was asking about the this idea of windows. Um, he was saying that um, the, he was really struck by the early window paintings that you posted on Facebook a little while back, and also the windows of your Times Square painting and your World Trade Center photo this evening. Um, he'd like to ask um, a question that he would have put to Edward Hopper as well. Which role comes more naturally to you, being the person inside the window looking out or the person outside the window looking in? What a great question, Jeff. And thank you so much for being here and for that fantastic question. I mean, I think both. It, it kind of, your question also reminds me of the introvert extrovert question that you might think about the person who's more comfortable watching uh, watching the world versus the person who's more comfortable being in the world, looking around the world. And I, I think as an extrovert, I think I'm more comfortable with the latter, but uh, L-A-T-T-E-R. But I also think that um, those early window paintings that I posted on Facebook that you're referring to, which were made before the World Trade Center, I think they influenced my World Trade Center experience. And, um, you know, windows are a very current topic, as you know. Thank you, Jeff. And um, another uh, question, just to follow up on from the, the screenshot of the theater group. Um, I, I know that also uh, you've been doing um, online work with your students uh, currently just with the necessity for remote learning. I, I was just wondering if, um, because obviously your approach is so very multi-sensory, very tactile, if there's mm, prompts or other types of activities you're giving your students um, to be able to have that type of 
tactile or multi multi-sensory experience within the limitations of remote learning? That is a great question, Lisa. So my favorite thing, I've my colleagues here will laugh because they've seen me do it more than once. Um, my favorite thing is to take the COVID uh, restrictions to a multi-sensory uh, re reviewing of our surroundings at home. So I've got this little basket here, for example, with a pattern. So uh, I, I taught about the Sahel exhibit at the Met, um, which is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And the work there in the show had a lot of tactile things, tactile sculptures. It also had a lot of musical instruments. So we, our people gathered bumpy things from home before the class started and we touched them, exchanged uh, what we found at home, which is a very important thing. Uh, teaching online to make that connection and not just to launch into teaching, but to say, hey guys, how's your day going? And what did you bring? What did you find as a way of getting started? It's much more, as you know, much more personable to be working from home. And then, um, matching the surfaces that we feel with what we see on the screen, learning about an artwork through that kind of multi-sensory engagement, drawing to the slides and drawing to the rhythms of the musical instruments. Like we, we saw a chora, a pair of, uh, uh, well, no, the chora actually was a, a sort of um, early lute and that was in the show and we listened to it and drew to it. So um, that's an example of a multi -set. And then of course, body poses, just getting around, we sit in front of our screen all day. So the movement is very, very important. Oh, definitely. That sounds wonderful. Uh, there was another question that came in from uh, Kathleen, who was really curious about your work with pulp, um, asking, do you prefer um, one medium over the other? And if so, why? Does working with such a medium that has such a rich texture affect the end work? Yes. I mean, right now I'm in love with pulp because it's, you know, the newest kid on the block. So I'm using, um, uh, I love working with pulp and it does create, uh, I don't have an example handy right now, but it, it creates literally a raised surface. It doesn't have to, you can put it, you, you can press it down and it flattens. But um, one of the things I like about pouring pulp is you take a bucket and it just kind of has its own life, like you saw us on with the vat. So part of it is left open to chance, which I really like. I like collaborating with Shannon. She may or may not be here, but she's from Carriage House in Brooklyn or Roberto in Rome, but getting another artist's view. So that's like another enhancement is to work with an, a master artist in the medium. And that collaboration is really special. Fabulous. Well, in the interest of time, we should probably wrap up our broadcast for now. Um, but again, if people are interested to know more about um, Pamela Lawton's work, you can find her website, which is just PamelaLawton.com. <laughs> and um, we also invite our audience members to join us this same time uh, next week uh, when we'll be speaking with our next speaker in this series, um, Fotis Levotomos, uh, who, as um, Pamela mentioned, had also collaborated with her um, in Greece as part of the Fulbright activities. So we hope you can all join us for that as well. So thank you so much, Pamela. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you everyone for coming.